Welcome back to Advancing with Watercolor. And uh, over the next series of videos, I'm going to be uh, talking about developing a motif. Uh, this is a process by which we take a singular subject and approach it in a number of different ways, varying the technique, varying the design, varying the image. Well, as you look at... Uh, Here's a little clip, a little video clip of my motif, which is the bridge at the Boston Public Gardens. Um, I'm looking at it in twilight here, and you get a feel for the size of the bridge, uh, the garden that surrounds it, the water element below. Even some of the uh, daylight is, is coming through here. But I'm going to be starting uh, my process by doing a few sketches of uh, different views of the bridge and I think this is really a good practice. In fact I would recommend this for the advancing artist to uh, take a motif if you haven't done so and uh, develop it in a similar way. You can see by these early studies that I'm using a single color but that I'm, uh, I'm simplifying my subject and trying to get a feel for the composition, a feel for the major shapes at play, and um, use that as my starting point, my, my jumping off point. And from this point, I'll develop uh, the motif through sketch, through um, paintings, changing the edges, changing the color, changing uh, the tonal dynamic. Uh, to, um, to achieve a better understanding of, of not only my subject, but of the sort of mood that I can portray uh, by varying any one of these elements. Well, the, this is good for the advancing artist because I think it illustrates how the artist looks at the world, especially if you see some of the preliminary work that I'm doing. You can see that I'm looking at my subject not necessarily as a bridge and trees and water and sky, but really as shapes, primarily shapes. And I'm making a big effort to see similarities in the shapes as opposed to seeing a distinction in these shapes where I can join shapes that are similar in value. I'm doing that in these early sketches. And... I'm looking for an exciting composition, a composition that I feel I can develop either in terms of color or develop in terms of uh, brush strokes or develop in terms of edges and uh, arrive at uh, some paintings that give us a, a different mood, give us a different feeling. Even though we're using the same motif, we're going to be generating a lot of different paintings from this. You can see in this one, I zoomed in and found an interesting collection of shapes in the trees and the reflections. So this part of the process, where I'm taking images or going to my subject and sketching, this part of the process is much like mining. We're digging out a lot of raw gems, gems that will be polished through paintings and through studies and uh, hopefully we arrive at some diamonds. In any case, it's a longer process because, uh, uh, well, we need that time to understand our subject, to internalize our subject, to be able to see our subject in our mind's eye and anticipate what we're going to do with uh, paint and brush even before we do it. Um, well, you heard me just describe the mind's eye, and I feel that more and more what I'm teaching is the ability to, to look at nature. Uh, before I go deeper into that, have a look at this photo. This, this might be a photo that, that I won't develop. It uh, doesn't have much appeal to me, and I think the main reason it doesn't appeal to me is the overall symmetry. It happens to be the most photographic view of the bridge, but has uh, doesn't really lend itself to painting, I feel. This is the image I'll be developing first in a sketch and then into a painting. And you can see that there's a interesting shape that's coming out of that image, a shape which I've developed 
in a, in a tonal study, and I've connected the tree to the bridge, to the adjacent tree, and to the shadows underneath. And I feel this gives me a, a strong, uh, an abstract quality that I can rely on to support the painting. So I've got my sketch in place, and I'm going to start with a couple of washes. These washes um, are the lighter part of the painting, the painting which I feel should come first. It's the sky. And in the sky, I want to uh, indicate that there's a movement of light going from left to right. I do this primarily uh, through the use of a graded wash. The graded wash is not only changing from a cooler aspect to a warmer aspect as it moves down the page, but it's also changing uh, from left to right. It's going to be darker on the right-hand side and paler on the left-hand side. And this combination will uh, give the effect of light moving from left to right. It's, um, it's a very effective tool to indicate the movement of light. So to return to an earlier point, um, I started to tell you that I, in my teaching, I feel I, I'm teaching um, students to see as much as to paint. And maybe they are um, very well connected. They are connected activities, but it all begins with seeing. It begins with seeing something of interest in your subject. And the artist looks differently at the world than... Um, than others. The things that make it different are we look at uh, the world as shapes. We look at the world as colors. We look at the world as lines. We look at the world as lights and darks and as edges, primarily because these are tools that we use in our painting. We try to see the natural world or the world around us in this manner, different then a scientist may look at the world different than a psychologist may look at the world different than a lot of other people look at the world. And this is primarily to see our subject in our mind's eye or see our subject as a stepping stone to painting it. As human beings, we're visual creatures, that's for sure. Our, probably our sense of sight has been developed um, as one of our strongest traits. However, that um, this gift of sight, the sight that we have, has been developed along practical terms. In other words, um, used to see anything that might be dangerous, used to see anything that might um, be tasty, food, uh, for sex, for, you know, seeing attractiveness in the opposite sex. These are things that kind of guide our vision and um, go on without our even thinking. Our, it, we tend to follow our eyes. However, when we're, when we're becoming a... Uh, when we're developing long artistic terms and starting to think about the world as the artist does, we have to make a conscious effort to sort of um, change the way we look at things. We're very good at seeing detail, about seeing nuance, and we're less apt, less uh, developed at, in terms of seeing the overall picture, the bigger picture, as I like to call it. So this is something that we have to uh, think about consciously. And we have to control that aspect to pick up detail and, and focus on detail um, as we're looking at our subject. Seeing the bigger picture, especially in the beginning, has much more potential for painting than seeing the detail. I don't want to say that detail is unimportant. It plays a role. But when we're starting off, as we are today, and, and looking at our motif and generating ideas, 
seeing the larger picture plays a much more important role. And I get off. Uh, this is a this is a uh, a series, and I've done this series before. And one of the questions that I get asked uh, most frequently is, "What makes a, a good motif? What is something that we should look for? What is something that defines a good motif?" Well, it can be anything, really. And we've seen that. We've seen examples of that throughout the history of painting. Rembrandt in his self-portraits. Renoir painted women. Um, Van Gogh painted sunflowers quite often. Artists find certain things that appeal to them, and for whatever reason, and they they develop a motif quite often through the length of their lives as artists. Monet is probably the most uh, obvious example of an artist who's taken a motif and developed it through a course of sometimes uh, 20, 30, 40, 50 paintings. We can think of examples such as his water lilies or the Seine River near Giverny or um, poplars. Recently, I saw an exhibition of Monet's work at the Worcester Art Museum, and it was only nine paintings, but these paintings were all of the Westminster Bridge that he painted from a favorite hotel of his. And since the paintings were all hung in the same room, there was uh, not only the experience of enjoying each painting and the quality that he brought forth in the painting, but the combined experience of seeing all these paintings together revealed uh, something unique as well, a sort of um, time element and a sort of um, composite of images that gave you a greater feeling of the atmosphere that he was painting and the light that he was painting and something uh, sort of indescribable or indefinable um, came out of looking at that exhibit as well. And I believe this is how Monet wanted these paintings to be seen together. Unfortunately, they've been collected by many different people and are scattered throughout the world. So to be able to see an exhibit of uh, the series that he did is unique and really worthwhile. If you have a chance, I recommend you to see an exhibit of Monet's series. In any case, your art, your favorite artist, I'm sure, is uh, is probably doing something similar with uh, with a motif. There is a big advantage to pursuing a motif. Typically. The student artist picks up one subject, does a painting of it, then moves on to the next subject, does a painting of it, etc. But with uh, developing a motif, we have a chance to, at prolonged study of a subject, and to see the subject in different ways, to look at it. Well, in the case of the uh, bridge at the public gardens, I can walk around it. I can look at it from different angles and find find views that appeal to me. I can see it in different seasons. I can see it at different times of day. And to me, this is what goes into making a good motif, is something that you can see in a different context and pursue it in this manner. I am much better than just doing the, uh, the same painting of the same subject over and over again. Soon that would be boring, but if we look at it in terms of um, changing the light a little bit, changing uh, the technique a little bit, we can certainly find material to work with this subject over a long period of time. And the benefit to the to the artist is really huge. Uh, what happens in the course of developing a motif, in the course of spending some time with a single subject, is you begin to memorize some of the physical components, whether they be 
parts of this bridge or parts of a landscape or parts of a house or the the expression of a pet or whatever sort of motif you pursue, you begin to memorize it. And this is a big advantage. The reason it's a big advantage is because you spend less time in study and more, more time in uh, thinking on how to express this subject. Let me give you a parallel example that I use a lot and I think you'll see the connection. The musician, when they pick up a new piece of music, and it could be a short piece, it could be a very long piece, the, the uh, musician picks up the piece and begins to read it and play it. And soon after that, they begin to memorize it so that they can play it without looking at the score. This is the goal, to internalize the music, to have it uh, in your body so that you can play it without seeing the score. And this completely liberates the uh, musician. We say they can play it by heart. And this by heart part is a very important component, being able to put yourself into the music the way a musician does. Often you'll see a, a concert violinist or concert pianist close their eyes and move their body as they're playing the music. They're, in essence, they're bringing the music out from inside. And we can do the same with painting, but we have to know our subject. We have to spend the same amount of time and effort internalizing our subject. This is my feeling anyway, and in, in many of these early paintings I'm getting to know my subject with the hope that later on I'll be able to perform it. So this has a, this is a big plus for the growing artist, is to be able to, in essence, come to know their subject so well that they can even put away the source photo or have nothing in front of them and paint this subject. And when you do this, when you reach this state, um, you start to tap into the creative side of your consciousness and you begin to uh, improvise. This uh, idea improvise is another term that's um, largely defined with music, but we can use it in our painting. And part of the goal of this series is to reach that point where we can improvise a bit. And it does take time. It's not, uh, it, for me anyway, it's not something that's accessible until I start to get to know my subject well. Then I feel I can play with the color aspect, I can play with the shape aspect, I can play with the tonality, and I can play with the edges. And when I have this uh, subject um, internalized to this state, I know that I'm paying much more attention on what's happening with the painting. I'm not glancing side to side every few seconds to check my measurements, to check my subject to see if I'm aligning things properly or putting things in the right place with the right color. No, what I'm doing is uh, giving almost 100% of my attention to what's happening on the paper. And for the watercolorist in particular, since it's a very animated media, this is, this is useful you can um, you can respond to things that happen on the paper. Uh, this is different than than saying, "Uh oh, I made a mistake," and uh, starting to lift out a part or adjust a part. You can respond to that and make something of it very often. So it uh, it changes the mindset when you have your subject internalized and can think uh, think of it as an improvisation. 
Well, all this while I've been painting, look at the subject, that that dark is really starting to play a, a big role in the painting. It's unified along the bottom. And we start to feel a sense of integrity in this lower section of the painting. Of course, my, my goal here is to now carry that same darkness, that same strength up into the upper left-hand side of the painting and um, paint that shape of the tree. Uh, this was my, really my impetus for picking up this image was I loved the way the dark shape traveled from the tree uh, through the bridge uh, to the other side. I felt it created a, a strong image and something that I could uh, see as a, as a sort of foundation for any sort of color work or edge work. If I could get this shape of uh, this dark shape moving across the painting, I felt that gave me a foundation for anything that I wanted to add to it. And that's what I'll be doing uh, through the next few videos is picking up a view of this bridge, the bridge at the Public Gardens in Boston. Picking up a view that I've sketched or photographed that I feel has potential and I'll be developing the, um, the image in terms of tonality, in terms of edges, building up a series of paintings around this one subject. And I believe by the end of this, uh, this series, uh, we'll have a clearer idea not only of uh, the beauty of this particular location, but we'll have an idea of what can be done with, um, with shapes and with colors and with edges to bring uh, uh, changing moods to this motif to uh, uh, ways that we can improvise with color, with edges, and, uh, and so on. So we'll be developing it from a point of view of watercolor technique, as well as some thoughts towards design, and uh, all using this single motif. Now you can see that I've I've created the the tree. I've left some some gaps so that we can see through the tree and fill the distant trees on the other side. But uh, in large part, I've I've been true to my first tonal sketch, which almost paid no heed to the to the distant trees. I placed them in my painting, but uh, they're for all intensive purposes, they're fading into the background and uh, supporting some of the lighter areas in the painting, but in general, receding. Very different than the photograph was showing us that had a strong uh, presence of trees. Adding some figures and adding some details to the columns at this point. In general, starting to decorate the scene. But the foundation is in place. I'd say 90% of the painting has been done. Everything that's added at this point is to uh, make the expression a little more subtle, uh, adjusting a few areas to make them recede, uh, adding a few brighter colors to bring a little life to the painting. Right now, the, the painting, of, especially through the darks, has a, a kind of singular color to it. Nothing wrong with that, but we could add a few colors here and there to liven it up. Another good place for color is into the figures, which, we'll, which we're adding now.
I've done this sort of uh, development of a series uh, most recently with the Trinity Church in Boston. And I'm going to provide some links into the description of this uh, video. And you can follow those links uh, to find a number of things. You can find uh, the materials list of materials that I'm using in this painting. You can find the links to the videos uh, which portray the Trinity Church in Boston. You can find also a PDF file that's been created for this uh, first video. And in that, in that PDF, it's, a, it's not a bad idea to look at it because I'm narrating this uh, as I see it and often I forget some things that I wanted to say or uh, veer from the, the main subject and, and that PDF gives, is more of a condensed thought on this subject of developing a motif and getting started doing that. So I recommend that at the end of this video, you have a look at the description and um, follow some of the links to see some of the supporting material. Well, the painting is nearly finished. In fact, uh, I'm going to show you the finished one. And uh, it's okay. I think it's successful in that it, it realized that, um, that initial idea I had of... Uh, of a nice, beautiful shape kind of weaving its way through the painting, a strong abstract quality to the dark elements in the bridge, minimized the background, and brought a feeling of morning light to this painting. And you can see that it's, it's relatively close to that first tonal study that I did, which, in which I feel I, I simplified what I was looking at and started to get a direction for the painting. So I'm going to continue with this series over the next few videos. Uh, next next week I'm going to be developing edges uh, with with the same motif, the public garden and the, the bridge at the public gardens. And so uh, have a look at the description to see some of the supporting materials that uh, I've created for this video. Thank you.